Good morning. My name is David Bure with Leviton Manufacturing. I'm a product manager here, uh, responsible for, among other things, some of our networking products when they're used in our commercial applications. Uh, and this here is uh, Andrew Maples. I'm one of our field service engineers, responsible for coming into the field and making sure that our equipment is operating correctly. Thanks, Andy. Today we're going to talk about one of our newer products called the Luminet to LumaCan Gateway. Now, this gateway is used very simply to bridge the gap between the Luminet networks on one side and the LumaCan networks on the other side. Uh, for those of you familiar with the history of our company and kind of how we got here, Luminet and LumaCan are both our proprietary architectural control protocols. That means that their network protocol is unique to Leviton, only used by Leviton, and they're used to facilitate the communication of our architectural uh, controls products with each other. Now, LumaNet is kind of our old standard. That's something that's been employed for a, a long time. LumaCan is kind of the new protocol that we're just now coming out with. Products that you'll find on the LumaNet network, things like D8 thousand, Dimensions 4000, A2000s, and some of those products. On the LumaCan side, you're going to see GreenMax, Sector, and uh, most of our future development. So since we have products that are active products, some LumaNet and some LumaCan, the job of the gateway is to split the two networks together and allow communication between the two of them so you can use both products as seamless as possible. Uh, so today we're going to walk you through just some basics about installing the device, terminating control wire types to the device, and configuration. Uh, and just so you have a nice overview about how to work it, how to use it, and how to uh, install it in the field. Uh, so with that, uh, Andy, maybe you could talk to us about how you install the product. No problem. For the installation, it is rather straightforward. We offer this in a desktop model. Just place it on a shelf or a desk. It can operate that way just fine. We also supply it with our rack mounted ears which attach the to the sides of the unit and allow it to mount in any standard equipment rack. Now if you'll notice with this the the unit itself is only half the size of the rack. If you have a second unit you can attach these together use the small rack ears and mount both in the same enclosure. Fantastic. And when you're doing that, you're going to use uh, both the short ears, right? Yes. Uh, in addition to that, you're also going to end up connecting the two side-by-side -side devices together with some screws that are provided with the unit. You just pop this cover off, run the screws through the holes, tie them together, and then you have one nice solid unit. Uh, what's this thing that it's uh, sitting on? This is our uh, one space equipment rack that we offer. We offer several equipment racks that you can purchase through Leviton. This happens to be one for making it easy to install the unit. Okay, fantastic. And this is one of those uh, sideways wall-mounted racks. So you mount it up on the wall. Um, some stuff on the way. You'll mount it out on the wall like this. The gateway will slide in the side. And you have all of this uh, working area inside for wiring termination, power termination. Uh, we put uh, a couple of KOs on it just for convenience. But most contractors are comfortable putting their own uh, KOs uh, in uh, enclosures wherever they need their metal products. Perfect. Let's talk about the, the power connections that we have for the unit now. And what we've got for power is we have our standard 12 to 24 volt barrel connection which is located here. We also provide a Phoenix connector which allows you to put 12 to 24 volts in depending on your use. If you're using it in a desktop model, you will probably be using the barrel connector. All right, for it. so the, the product can be provided from the barrel connector or those two-part terminals. It can also be powered from LumaCan, correct? That is correct. All right, fantastic. And just for notes, in any planned permanent install, what we really want you to do is we want you to use uh, this terminal here uh, and run a, a permanent low voltage uh, connection with a low voltage power supply into these terminals. The second choice would be uh, using the LumaCan input or providing power on LumaCan. That works really well if you happen to have it next to a GreenMax panel and you have some extra capacity in your GreenMax power supply. Uh, of course, the third choice, if you're doing some desktop testing or just some early system planning, uh, you can certainly power it with just a regular you know, wall wart style power supply. Uh, and as Andy says, 12 to 24 volts inputs, that's labeled right here on the back panel. Same information on the data sheet and in manuals. The current requirement is 0.6 amps. 
Okay, let's talk about some of our connectors that we have on the back of the unit now. We have our Luminet connector. Again, it's our standard Phoenix connector that we've been using for our Luminet products for many years. There's also a Luminet termination switch. Luminet has to be terminated at the ends of line. So if this is an end of line device for Luminet, it would need to be terminated. You can also pass Luminet through this device. So in that case, you would take the termination off. And if you are passing it through, you would just land both sets of wires on the connector here. Our other green connectors on the back side are our Lumican. We have two Lumican connectors. These Lumican connectors allow us, to, again, to do in and out. These are RJ45 connectors. And for those, Leviton is recommending that we use the B standard for uh, the RJ45 terminations. All right, so let's just revisit that. So Lumican, we prefer that you run with CAT6. Yes. In some applications, CAT5E is allowed. Um, but but we really want you to run CAT6, and that's what we put on our drawings. And we want you to wire it using the TIA 568B standard. That is correct. All right, fantastic. And you've got two connectors there, so that's for your incoming and your outgoing run? Yes. Okay, great. And again, we have our two termination switches on here so that we can terminate the Lumican. We have one, one is for, there's two switches here. One is for Lumican termination, and the other is for power. If we are wanting to pass power through the unit across the Lumican, we can turn that switch on to allow that to happen. And if you put that switch in the off position, Lumican power will be segmented between the two receptacles. So basically the power lines aren't connected. That is correct. It divides the power so you can power right. it separately on each half. And that's going to be important when you have power supplies on the Lumican network out powering devices. Lumican works much the same way Luminet does in that you might have multiple power supplies on a network depending on what devices you have out there. And when you do that, you really want to segment the network so you only have one power supply provided power to each network segment. So that's what that switch is for. Yes. The other things on the back, we have our Ethernet connection. The Ethernet connection is predominantly going to be used for configuration when we are configuring the unit uh, via a web interface. Because we do have the ability to configure this with, with a web interface and we will be showing that shortly. All right, fantastic. So, you know, as, as Andy mentioned, you know, this device gets configured over the web. Um, and maybe we just pick it up here and show you a couple things uh, on that topic. Uh, there's also an SD card right here in the back. And on the SD card, that's kind of where the file system is stored. And it's actually kind of neat. You can take this SD card out of the unit, connect it up to your PC, and you can browse the configuration data, uh, as well as dump new software onto the SD card right from your PC, and it'll load uh, direct into the device. So that brings up a couple of topics. So Andy mentioned you can configure from a web browser, but you also can browse configuration files from a PC. Now let's look at a situation where that would be really helpful. Let's say you've got two gateways on the job site and you want their configuration to be identical. One quick and easy way to do that is take the two SD cards out, put them in your computer, copy the configuration file off of the one that's just the way you want it, and put it on the other one. Then when you pop it into the unit and power it up, it'll adopt that new configuration. Please remember when you're doing that, that they do require unique IP addresses. So when you copy the config, you have to make sure in the second unit you will change the IP address. All right, fantastic. And you can um, do that right on the SD card by editing the text file? That is correct. All right, the other way that we let you get into the device, this device is via FTP. So you can put the SD card in your computer, one method. Second method, use FTP to transfer files back and forth. And of course, for primary configuration, we really do that through the, the web browser. Now, that brings up one of the other interesting things, is you'll notice there's an LCD display over on the right side of the device. This tells you a lot of interesting diagnostic information. The one that's probably the most important right now is the IP address. I can take a look at this device. I can see its IP address is 10.15.74.115. If I type that address into my web browser when I'm connected to the device over Ethernet, it's going to load the configuration page. Now, a lot of times we'll plug into it and we'll type the IP address and then we just can't get there. 
uh, if you can't connect it, the next step is to open up a DOS prompt and try and ping the device. Uh, that's just using the standard ping command. The syntax at the DOS prompt is going to be ping, a space, and then the IP address. So in this case, we type in ping 10.15.74.115, and we should see some, some responses. If we don't, check your computer's IP address and make sure your computer is on the same subnet as this device. Because one of the basic rules of Ethernet networking is that in order for two devices to communicate, uh, they both must be on the same subnet or there must be a router transferring data between subnets. In the cases of our lighting control networks, uh, you're really just going to follow the first rule, which is all devices must be on the same subnet. So to do that, go into your computer's IP setting, set it up to an address of like 10.0.0.1 with a subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. Uh, hit the OK to save that button, then more than likely your connectivity issue is going to be resolved. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to open up the web page and show you how to configure the, this device and talk about the common configuration settings. So just to catch you up where we're at, what we've done is Andy's connected his computer up to the gateway and he's typed the IP address found on the front of the gateway into his web browser. That brought up the screen you see in the background. Now the first thing that you see when you load that configuration screen is you're going to see a username box. So Andy's going to go ahead and log into the device using some security credentials. Uh, he'll share with you what those are. You also can find them in the manual. And then we're going to walk you through all of the configuration properties. So the username is admin. So we're going to type admin, click OK. It's going to prompt us for the password. The password is password. So once we are inside the unit, we can now make some adjustments. We can adjust the username and the password can be adjusted from there. Hey, before you jump into the settings, check out that top line. I see it says status, load complete. What does that mean? The status load complete, once we have made our adjustments to the config, there's a load button at the bottom of the screen that we will push that will send the, this information out to the unit to apply it to the unit. Once that uh, application has happened, the status will then go back to being load complete. Okay, the, the other thing that you'll notice, if for some reason you're having intermittent communication to the gateway, that that status won't say load complete, it might say failed to load. So if it says failed to load or gives you another error message, it means we couldn't properly retrieve the configuration information from the gateway. That is correct. So we have our username and our password followed by the name of the gateway. And again, we assign that based on the MAC address of the unit and that can be adjusted to base your site needs. If you have several, you can name them by their location so it's easier to find. All right, so we recommend that you change that name to something appropriate from where it's at, like the gateway on the first floor or the gateway in room 112 or something along those lines? That is correct. Okay. Gives you more information about the unit. We now have a Luminet address and a LumaCAN address. Both Luminet and LumaCAN require us to have addresses for the device to participate on the network. Since this device is bridging the two protocols, we will have to have an address for both protocols we are bridging. I see that both are currently set to zero. At the zero value, there's no communication on the network at all. So there's no transmission. It's just sitting there participating. That is correct. So in, in our setup here, I'm just going to change both of them to one. Since they are separate networks, they can both have the same ID for LumaNet and LumaCAN. We now have the ability to enable or disable DHCP. If this is sitting on a building network, we can enable the DHCP where it will get its IP address from a DHCP server. If this is just a standalone unit, there's no reason to enable that, and we can actually disable it. Yeah, and one of the things you'll notice is when the device is booting up, it'll say waiting for DHCP server. It takes approximately 30 seconds for it to try and get an address and then to fail if one's not on the network. So if you're not going to use the DHCP server, we recommend that you disable that setting, and that will achieve the fastest boot times. When you disable the DHCP, you now have the ability to adjust the IP address and the subnet mask. By default, we are going to be in a 10 dot IP address with a subnet mask of 255.0.0.0. But again, those are adjustable based on the network needs that you are placing, the network you're placing the unit on.
Yeah, that, that 15.74.115 that you see in the IP address field, those correspond to the last three digits of the MAC address. And MAC addresses within Leviton equipment, we all have our own MAC address block. So you're guaranteed in a Leviton system using that you know, hybrid between manually and automatically assigned address is always going to be unique. So a lot of the time you can just stick with that same address. In other cases, however, you might need to set it to an address that is more compliant with the system that you're working on, uh, and you might have to change that. So feel free to adjust those settings. Again, the current IP address will always be noted on the LCD, so discovering it is never a problem. Now, that brings up another point. One of the tools that's distributed with the gateway is called the ColorNet Discovery Tool. We're not going to talk about that product today, but what that is is it's a little utility app application and it just browses the network and tells you what devices are out there or what Leviton devices are out there on the Ethernet address uh, or out there on the network. So it'll let you find gateways, NPC, XP's DLR, our two port nodes, or basically any of our Ethernet products. Continuing down, we have the Map Luminet Channel to LumaCAN Channel. This gives us the ability to take a channel of Luminet and apply it to a channel of LumaCAN. Typically we're going to do this in a one-to-one. -one. So channel one on LumaNet would apply to channel one on LumaCAN. Makes conversion very simple and very easy to understand. But if you need an offset, you can do that. So if you wanted LumaNet channel one to apply to LumaCAN channel 101, you could set that up. All right, so in this situation, what we're showing is we're showing that LumaNet channel one is mapped to LumaCAN channel one, and 2,048 channels are mapped. That means any time LumaNet channel one changes, like a D8000 station sets channel one to a C to a level, say 100%, and maybe channel two to 50%, that's going to translate to LumaCAN channels one and two going to exactly those same levels. This is what we call a basic one-to-one -one patch. Uh, you know, ones to one, two to two, three to three, and it goes on to 2,048 channels. Now, Andy, do you recommend that um, a one-to-one -one patch we leave it set like this, where 2,048 channels are changing or are, are always mapped one-to-one, -one, or do you recommend that we shrink that down? What's the best field practice? The best field practice is we want to only patch the range that we are using. So, if we are only using 512 channels, we're going to adjust that down to 512. If we're only using 200, we're going to adjust that down to that number. So the best practice then is to set the length of the patch to as small as possible, but do you think it's maybe a good idea to give us a buffer of uh, you know, 100 or 200 channels if we can? I typically will give a, give a buffer of, of 100 to 200 channels, yes. So if you've got a system where you've got maybe a green max panel at 1 through 48 and a couple bus controllers at maybe 49 through 60, what would you set that to? I would probably go ahead and set that at 256. All right, so you do about 256 channels. And that's all job site specific, so that's something you're just going to have to re review your specific application to determine what that needs to be set to. We do have the ability to apply a default Luminet priority. Leviton's default priority is priority 8, so typically that will, field will go unadjusted. Yeah, one of the things that we've gained when we went to a LumaCAN network is all of our channel messages have priority with them. Uh, this is very similar to the priority, priority enacted in ZMAX and over BACnet and that you have 16 levels of priority. As Andy mentioned, all Leviton product default at priority 8. If, however, you need to map LumaNet channel changes to LumaCAN channel changes at a higher or lower priority, that's when you'd want to adjust that, that value. Uh, if you don't have a reason to change it, leave it at 8, and that's probably going to be the 95% configuration. As we are going down, we can adjust our message delay for our LumaCAN. Again, we set it at 110 milliseconds, and that is where we will want to leave it unless directed specifically to change that. We do have some, some filtering and some suppression checkboxes down at the bottom that allow us to adjust some things about the message. Again, typically these would only be done at the direction of our technical services staff.